Great. Thanks and praise for the Lord. This message today is going to mean something deep to some, and it's going to prepare others because you will get to the place where you need this message one day or another. And we live in an age that that word offense is really prevalent in our society. Offended. That word has taken on, in my lifetime, greater meaning than I ever have wanted to put on or concentrate on that word in all of my existence. People today are running campaigns based on that word offense. Everybody's got to be careful because we might offend somebody. And now, don't be surprised because God already knew that this, this was going to be the case. And God, I used to think that God could not be offended. But I believe the scripture says that God can be offended. Now, if you go to the Psalms and, um, and it talks about those who abide in the word should not be offended. That's the King James Version. But if you go to another version and actually look up the actual meaning, it really doesn't mean offense like we like to use in every day. It means stumbling. How many know that people get offended and stumble? It's possible to conclude or jump to conclusions when your feelings. Now, God is in control of his feelings. He's in control because he's God. But you can do things that offend the gospel or offend God. But when we offend each other, it is amazing to me that um, that has taken on a new idea in this modern or postmodern, postmodernity, whatever they want to say, and uh, in this hour. So in this age of, let me use another word. In this age of insults and offenses, we as Christians must be reminded and we need to remember it's a sin. Anybody know what a sin is anymore? <laughs> it's a sin to allow other people to offend us and stop us from doing what God wants us to do or has called us to do. So how, how do you handle, let me add another word. How do you handle criticism when you're making a stand for the gospel and righteousness? How do you handle criticism? How does one protect himself from the, what we, the scripture calls the scourge of the tongue? And I'm going to ask you to stand with me for this reading of one verse of scripture. Out of Job 5 and 21, New American Standard Bible, the Bible says you will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. Neither will you be afraid of violence when it comes. I'm going to read it again. It sounds like a, almost a poem. Watch. You will be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. Neither will you be afraid of the violence when it comes. Let that ring in your spirit today. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Where, you know, the, there's places called safety zones or my safe place. And new ideas and, and, and almost turned into doctrines. And, uh, and many have turned into laws and calling this, this my safe place. And, uh, but... Um, Understand, where, where is the safety, where is the place of safety from accusations? Now, I don't know about you, but accusations are hard to deal with. If you are going to be successful in the Lord's work and as a witness for Jesus Christ, you must find God's 
hiding place. Not my safety place, but God's hiding place. From one of the most painful, listen, weapons in Satan's arsenal, and that is the critical tongue. The critical tongue. Let it not be named among us to have a critical tongue. The fact is, the better, for better or for worse, people are going to talk about you. Come on, somebody. If you've been living long enough, you've already understood that. I wish people wouldn't talk about me. You're wishing the wrong thing. Amen. Because actually, I'm going to tell you something that's going to sound strange until we get into this message. And that is, God allows it. God allows it. Now, you cannot do the will of God, watch this, without causing change. How many know people don't like change? You know the old adage, change is here to stay. And so understand, and, and changes will all, watch this, will always cause somebody to stumble. It always happens this way. You see, because in fact, Jesus said we were to beware when all men speak good about us. And you see that in Luke 6 and 26 and also written in another place. But this is, this is a reference to, in a general sense, it's a reference to flattery. You know, it's amazing to me. People are attracted immediately to flattery. That's not a bad thing. But if you don't filter that through what's right by God, it can be a bad thing. Flattery is not always bad, but depending on the motive and depending on what it is being said for, that flattery is also talked about in Scripture as not a good thing. And so he said we, can, we cannot serve, watch, two masters. God wants loyalty to one. And Luke 16, you see that as well. But if we will truly please the Lord, if we're truly going to please God, which is our mission, number one. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. We cannot be distracted. How many know that distraction comes? Distraction comes by trying to please everyone. You can be distracted by trying to be a man pleaser. That is not a good thing that is a distraction you see at the same time there is a watch this and I'm going to jump in what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights in here recently and that is there's a demonic strategy that is set against those who teach God's word anyone who teaches God's word you become a target in the demonic world and so the enemy's campaign is not only to, uh, not only aimed at destroying the shepherd. How many know many shepherds have fallen? And it's a huge distraction when it happens. Yeah. But the enemy is not just aimed at destroying the shepherd. He also speaks to scatter and seeks to scatter the sheep. And so if Satan's attack is successful, everyone involved... Watch this. We'll leave the battle with less love and a hardened heart. That's, that's the outcome. And if Satan can get you to the place where you have to, uh, uh, people have to earn your love, and be careful to think about this. If, if we get to the place, and Satan can get you to the place where people have to earn your love, how many know? That God loves everyone, but He doesn't respect everyone the same way. Amen. Love is unconditional because that's what we get. Uh -huh. But just because the Bible says to love your enemy, that means you don't want evil to uh, take them out and, and for your personal revenge, if you know what I'm talking about. But, um, but we don't have to support the evil, Amen. but we love people. Yeah. I want to say that up front because when these messages get hard and strong, 
people forget that pastor still loves you. And uh, so this happens. Satan wants us to get to the place where our heart is hardened. And we're in this society of offenses. It's easy to start building a wall. And then that wall, you might be trying to keep some situation out. But that wall ha bleeds over and starts keeping out things and situations that God wants in. You say, well, preacher, what do we do? I'm getting ready to tell you to stay patient. I find it amazing that if individuals can react so differently to the same teaching. You've heard me say this over and again. I, I always find it amazing that I, I stand in that door of what in this church for 31 years, I think. Maybe going on 32, something like that. And I have preached messages and and I would get some shake hands and, and hug the neck. That was a word from God, and that word was from me. Then I'd walk out the door and somebody's going. <laughs> trying to get by me as quick as they can. <laughs> and then I'll hear about it later. Somebody told you that. Or that was offensive. That wasn't love. That was this. That was that. And the other ones would come on and say, man, that was a great word. It's amazing that the same teaching can create a dichotomy right in this church. It always has boggled my mind. So what why do you filter or correct the message based on those who are offended? Or do you stick to the message based on what is righteous before God and be as one of the prophets even if you're killed? Alright. So one will be uplifted and one will be encouraged while another may not even uh, may, may only they'll miss the Lord's blessing because they're guarding something they still want to hold on to. All right. You know what's amazing? It, it, what it seems interesting to me is that um, while an, uh, while while one person uh, may be taking a hammer and a chisel and, and, and make a monument unto a hero of a pastor, when the other person takes a hammer and chisel just to tear him down. All right. You see, it seems that for every person who who does this, there's always a, 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 a someone who's offended. So what do we do? Do we, do we start uh, curtailing the message? Do we start, like the old words are, watering it down so that, so that are we supposed to, to bring dummy everything down to the lowest common offended person? Or are we supposed to continue to lift up the cross and lift up the message and then let God take care of who's offended and who's not. Amen. You see, and, and let's understand, people need to remember that you have a choice with every message. And so, it, it, just remember also that pastors and ministers and teachers, they're not supermen. God calls humans even flawed humans, to deliver his message, to deliver the mission. And um, so we know that God uses imperfect people, but those who have a calling on their heart in their lives, and, and they have an anointing for that, they're going to answer with a stricter judgment, but at the same time, they're still human. And you've got to remember that. You know, Revelation calls pastors angels. I kind of like that. <laughs> it simply means messenger. What I'm saying is don't kill the messenger. Amen? For most, church, and I, I'm going to shift gears in a second here. Church is a place people go to express their worship unto God. That's what we're supposed to do. And to be taught and to have fellowship, the koinonia. And so, but to the man or woman of God, the church is God's garden. That's a beautiful, like that's opening statement. I said, I love church. Amen. I love being in church. I love being around church while we were away Saturday night. And I love all the churches. 
I just think some of them are drier than cracker juice. But, but there's some. Now, we were on our way, we were on our way to a hospital and situation, and Sandra and I said, we, We're going to hit, hit, a, hit a church on the way to the hospital somewhere. Amen. So we went to a Baptist church. Can you believe that? <laughs> Mount Hermon. It looks like a monument from the turn of the century. You walk in. But the message was clear. And the message was good. Methods were different. But God's message was being preached, which I appreciate that. Of course, I didn't get to raise my hands or say amen. But, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but I, I loved the, the church setting. These people, are God loves them and they love God. And I want to just say something quickly about the church. Is that the church is the extension of Jesus himself walking on the earth. And so I have, when you study Paul's writings about the church and how God uh, orchestrates and, and, and calls the church because it's Jesus, it's the body of Christ. We're extension now of the body of Christ. So here's what I'm getting ready to say. Is that... <laughs> I used to think that you can have a little leeway not being in church. And I really would love to embrace that. But my friend, the Bible just doesn't teach it. If you do not love church, you don't love Christ. That's the Bible. That is not me wanting attendance. That's the scripture. You study that and it makes sense. And so, if you treat church lightly, it's a reflection of how you truly treat Christ. If you have a problem with church, you have a problem with Christ. You show me in Scripture, I'll sit down and be taught. You can't show me in Scripture where you can treat church less than you treat Christ. It's not there. As a matter of fact, it is a test whether you're saved or not. Some people, I just don't want to, I, my church is on the water fishing and all this, that, and, that, and I, I love all that stuff too. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think you have to go to church to be saved. I do. Yeah. All right. You've heard it from me. The scripture I've been reading through lately, and I've had to reevaluate. I do. I don't think saved people want to stay home. Amen. If you have a problem with church, you have a problem. God created the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. It ain't the body of the church, so to speak. The Bible calls it the body of Christ. Oh, dear, now somebody's going to say, what's he up to? It's July and people are out. And that's why he's got this message. No, no. The work of a pastor extends beyond the pulpit, folks, because it, it, it's that unhindered service of cultivating love and trust and, and, and personal relationships. So it's just not this. It's getting along with people. And uh, in God's eyes, the church is much more than a meeting place. So you understand, of, 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 it's not a meeting place of casual acquaintances or even doctrinally united believers. Understand, to the Father, the church is a living temple. A human house of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of His Son. You see, the Bible says that when we placed, that when He placed us in a particular church, if you go to 1 Corinthians 12 and 18, you're going to have to understand something. That God, the Bible says, He does something that pleases Himself. He places people in the body as it pleases Him, Amen. not as it pleases you. We have this litany. We have this criteria. Now, don't get me wrong. I think you need to be in a place where you don't feel like the spirit is hindered. But you need to be in a place also where the word is taught. Not just to your specifications. But to what is righteous in the word and what God would be pleased with. Amen. And so you've got to understand that, that the Bible actually says that's something that God does because it pleases him. And so who are you 
to say, God, I don't want you pleased today because I don't feel like being a part of church. You have a problem. And I'll tell you, the pro biggest problem today is the word is not being taught like it should be. Because we're afraid of what? Offending someone. Now you're getting back to the message. Offending someone. You see, understand this. That um, when we, when relationships are severed and destroyed through malicious gossip, or when a developing trust is turned into mistrust and, um, and through backbiting. And, and here's that word, criticism. Did you know that you're not offending that person only, but you're actually offending God? Amen. You offend the church, you're offending Christ. You see, because understand, and I'll go a step further. And then if you have messed with God and his stuff, today we don't want anger taught in the church as it relates to it being something supported. Over 400 times God has mentioned in his Bible in scripture, over 400 times anger and wrath is mentioned all the way through the Old New Testament as well. And over 300 times God's the one who's mad. So the Bible says in Ephesians to be angry but don't sin. Anger is neutral. It's a, something that you, we need to be taught to be used for the glory of God. It gets us off of our laurels and into the mission. Right. You can be angry at what is being done against God's kingdom and go out and heal something. Some people are not motivated until they get angry. Some people won't write a petition until they get angry at something. They can see it happen to everybody else, but when it happens to you, oh, it's amazing how they can drum up a coup <laughs> and write a pledge. And start getting support because it happened to you. They got angry and did something about it. But righteously. And so watch this. The Bible says that God himself is, 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 is angered. I mean, I'm going to use, I, I can actually take this next scripture in Proverbs. And I'll have to come back and dissect it all. Oh, that would be another message. But the Bible says, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that uh, devises wicked imaginations, feet to be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that sows discord. Discord is dissonance, disharmony, disagreement, conflict, dispute among the brethren. Do y'all see that? Somebody says, well, I withdraw my complaint today in Jesus' name. Okay, I appreciate it. <laughs> and, if, and if God is offended, how much more difficult is it for his servant to remain aloof from the conflict that sin causes? Here's the answer. So how does a man or a woman of God find the balance between his basic need to survive and his responsibility to please God. How do we do that? Well, we have to also be taught God's philosophy, if I can say it that way. The scripture, the scripture has a philosophy, a, a way to live. The answer is in the word of God. The Bible is still the word of God. Amen. And realize that it is also, we put on not just the, 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 the letter of the word but we put on the love of Jesus you have to guard that the love of Christ there's a type of constructive criticism coming through people who love you which teaches and helps you to prosper amen people who love you they'll give you constructive criticism and it's to help you Prosper. Matter of fact, they're telling you, even if they can't prosper in what you're doing, but they can see the potential in you prospering, they don't mind helping you getting to a place that they can't even go themselves. That's true love. All right. Amen. How many in this room would help somebody else prosper even if it does not benefit you? That's true love. All right. 
That's true faith because I believe God brings all things back together. And if whatever you help somebody else do, God will help you in a different way. Amen. And so watch this. So this can now, and there is a type of criticism that comes through an embittered spirit that is not meant to correct you, but actually is meant to destroy you. And you've got to be careful of that. You see, because these people may say they come into you in love. And I just want to give you some constructive criticism. But it's amazing to me that they get angry and mad when you don't receive their instruction. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. The one who wants to give you constructive criticism is not mad when you don't receive it. That's true love. That seed in love would do more than you get angry because they didn't listen. Amen. They're not listening. I don't know why God sent the prophets to preach to people that wouldn't listen. So what was the benefit that they obeyed God and got peace in themselves? Amen. That's the benefit. You see, you, you can be manipulated by people's criticisms. Your, your sense of peace can be governed by the acceptance, the acceptance or rejection of a certain man's insight. Now, I have experienced this. Uh, this is going to be, I'm going to use experience based on the scripture. If your experience can't be based on scripture, you're just having an experience. But if you can base it on scripture, then you're having a revelation. And so we got to understand this. I've experienced this. God does not always deliver you from the enemy's accusations. Amen. We'll chase every deliverance ministry for everything in the world. But God's not. There are some places where people are still praying for deliverance from something God is not going to deliver you from. And that takes a little more insight and a little more maturity to check this out in Scripture. Be under some good teaching and you won't chase stuff that's empty. God does not deliver out of every criticism. He does not deliver out of every enemy's accusation. I wish he would. Because I've had a few. He saves you. Watch this. It's a paradox that rings loud and clear in Scripture. He saves you by killing that part of you that was vulnerable to the devil, and he did it with the accusations themselves. Oh, my goodness, preacher. I didn't want to come to church to hear this. I wanted to come here that God was going to destroy my enemy for lying against me. That's what I want to hear. Both God, this is what I've learned. See if you can get it from my heart. How many know that we live in the tension of two worlds? The kingdom of God, here we are. And then the kingdom of Satan, here we are. We live in the tension of both of those worlds. How we respond to either tension determines the level of our success or our demise. Watch this. So how do you tell humans that God loves, God heals, God delivers and sanctifies, and fills with the Holy Ghost, and gifts are dripping off our fingers? Yet, we're in the tension of two worlds that both want to kill you. Listen, don't, don't get distracted. God wants me to die, and so does Satan. Are y'all with me? Lord, what's up with that? You want me to die, and Satan's trying to kill me. What, what's, all up, what's all this about? Satan, watch this. Satan wants to destroy you through slander and then drain. I read, I read a counseling book years ago. It talked about be careful how many, what people you let in your circle because some people will want to encourage you. And then they had a caption called drainers. 
There are people that just want to drain you. They want to pull up your rubber plug and just drain you of everything you got. That's right. How many know some people like that? Never, oh, wait a minute. Point them out. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> there are people that you do want to go down a different aisle in Walmart when you see them. <laughs> Sandra and I am being vulnerable and transparent. Sandra has grabbed my arm and said, let's walk over here. I said, what? What's wrong? Just trust me. <laughs> Satan wants to destroy you through this slander, and he wants to watch. He wants, how does he, what's a, what's a good example of draining? Let me give you one of the premier examples of being drained. Is that after a false accusation, that's gotten around. You become drained because you keep telling your side of the story. I'm talking to grown-up Christians in this church this morning. I'm talking about I'm talking to people who like revelation. Y'all like revelation? It is draining to have to walk around and keep telling your story over and over, your side of the story over and again in defense of that accusation. There are just some things you're just going to have to let it be. And you're not going to win. Even those who were affected uh, that we call, what do you call that? When, when, it's, when you're in a, in a war and, and the casualties. And understand that at the same time, you see, you're going to get drained if you constantly have to always go around and defend that accusation against you. Satan is enjoying every minute of it. Because the more he can train you, the more you will lose faith that God's taking care of it or God's doing something through all this mess. I ha I'm sorry to say, but many people have gone to their grave with an accusation. And you're going to be surprised to see him in heaven. All right. Amen. So God wants to crucify that part of your soul that was so easily exploited by the devil in the very first place. You see, it will not be over until you die. You keep telling the story over and again, over and again. Now, there may be a couple you have to tell the story to, but if you have to keep going to people who are just drainers, Stop it. You're going to have to move on. Because God wants you to die in that area. Why do you think it's still allowed to be there? God could zap it and it'd be gone. But um, it is probably at the point that you finally and truly become a servant of God. When you die into this area, put the plug back in the drain and say, just let God be God. And I'm just going to have to let, let the Lord. Listen, you take care of your character. God will take care of your reputation. Amen. Amen. This will, this, believe it or not, this is an inoculation going on in your heart and mind by the spirit. From the praise of men. We're looking for compliments. We're looking for people to praise you and, and give you the attaboys. But when that dries up, then what? You trusted just man? You pleased just man? Or are you waiting on God to come down and get into your heart and mind and give you wisdom from the Lord? And He wants you to be a solid Christian. He wants you to be a Christian that will stand up when nobody else is standing. He wants you to be a Christian that is supporting when nobody else is supporting you. Yeah. All right. This is the way God has created the Christian experience to be. You're going to be alone in many things, but God said you're never alone. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I tell you what this is? God will baptize you in criticism until that part of your defense dies. I'm talking from experience. That's the thing that young whippersnappers don't have yet. And you see, 
understand until you die to the control of man, the accusations will come and they will offend you. No more, no, no, man no longer rules me. I live for God's pleasure. And if I happen to please man, then praise God, that's the way it'll be. All right. I'm going to please the Lord with all of my heart. But if I happen to please men along the way, amen. All right. Amen. All right. Amen. Let me just move into third gear. And let's recognize the shelter of the cross. I want you to know that there is something utterly marvelous about the Lord's redemptive work in our lives. And that is no matter what hardship, devilish plot, or accusation is hurled our way, everything Satan would use to destroy is redeemed by God's love and then used to perfect us. If we faithfully seek the Lord, adversity becomes like gasoline upon our hearts fire for God just to survive. We are driven deeper into the blaze of his presence because those things that come against us actually worked out for his glory and my betterment. All right. Do y'all believe that with all of your heart this morning? As much as you hate it when people slander you, this is the very thing God uses to compel you nearer to his heart because God heals the wounded. Don't look for man for a band-aid. As important as Bible study and church attendance is, as we have laid down in the foundation of this message, it is, it is adversity which works the deepest depth of self and brings you closer to God. Matthew 5 and 10 says, I can see why Jesus said this, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of what? Righteousness. For theirs is present tense is the kingdom of heaven. Certainly it does not mean that the that um, outward, outwardly we experience heaven. He's not saying you're, you're being raptured out at this moment. When we are persecuted or suffer mental or physical abuse he's talking about a heavenly experience on the inside. No but inwardly, God's deal, God deals mightily, how many know, with our soul. Breaking its addiction to man's approval and liberating us to truly live for Jesus Christ authentically. Authentically. Do you understand? The authenticity of a Christian is always in a lonely place with Jesus Christ. You see, you know you are who you are all by yourself in the dark and nobody looking. Amen. That's who you really are. And we see that the Bible talks about in his wisdom, God gives us gifts. One of the wonderful gifts, and I'm not talking about the manifestation gifts or the grace gifts. I'm talking about the new nature. The new nature. And along with it, the cross. No! No, preacher, why, why, go, why go to those areas of morbidity and uh, death and, and speak of that kind of thing that's painful? <laughs> because we get, we're getting too much of an ice cream gospel in this hour. All right, yeah. And not enough of the meat and potatoes that God wants us to sustain ourselves for his glory. Yeah. Do you all understand this today? That there's a, there, is a, there is a famine of the hearing of the word of God that the Bible talked about. It's not a famine of the preaching. In some places it is. But if you know that something's not right with God in that preaching or that message, then it's up to you to find that place of sustenance in the scripture and in the spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Because God's not pleased with you sitting under a heretic. That's right. Only because you like his music at the end and how he gives you words. I won't go there. You see, in wisdom, he gives us the nature, the new nature and the cross. That's our place of protection. We must learn this truth. God does not want our old nature to survive. Why don't we just get a hold of that? Why don't we just embrace? He doesn't want the old you to survive. 
You see, because he does not want us to reform what he actually needs to crucify. You see, he wants what we were. He wants what we were to die. That old you to die. Not only was our old self indefensible against the enemy. Why do you want to go to the old you? Because the old you could not fight the devil either. He says, but it's, it's corrupt. That nature is corrupt. It's akin to the devil when you go to the old you. You're more akin to the devil than you are God. And the devil is more accessible. And he to you when you nurture the old nature. You see, the character of the new nature, however, is Christ himself. We've got to lift up Jesus Christ. We've we got to quit waffle, looking at our watches when a good sermon is being preached. You've got to want Christ. You've got to want the meat. You've got to want truth that makes you free. And so, <clears throat> then understand this, that um, it's Christ himself. And when the living Christ within me how shall I bring a charge against my neighbor for Christ commands me to love? Because of the nature of Christ that's in me. You see, if we will be the Lord's servant, if you're going to be a true Christian today, lighthouse folk, if we're going to be true Christians today, when offended, remember us talking about in the beginning, when offended, I must repeat Christ's prayer of the cross. When he said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them. They have lost their minds. <laughs> they don't know what in the world they're doing. They don't know which end is up and down. If you realize that, and you have that revelation about a person, then it's easier to understand how to forgive them. So regardless of man's opinions about us, Church, we're running into an hour. We're going to find out who's truly Christian. Mm -hmm. Whether we are exalted or whether we are based, understand, let us determine to carry Christ's cross through any and all conflict. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. All right. For these momentary light afflictions, the Bible tells us whether they are... Uh, <clears throat> whatever they may be, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond what we could even imagine good for ourselves. Right. You see, my personal attitude is this, and I'm going to say something that may make some people, <clears throat> I'm Pentecostal. Right. Amen. Amen. I believe in speaking in tongues, yes. the gifts, healing, yes. deliverance, yes. revival. But can I tell you something about revival? Nathan's laughing because we talk about it a lot. Did I use that word authenticity today? I want to use it in context of revival. I don't doubt that God can go to a certain church and start a special movement in that church. I really believe that. But there are charlatans. Yes. There are people Amen. who don't know that scripture enough <clears throat> that they're toying with the body of Christ right. instead of toiling with the body of Christ. Right. Okay, y'all didn't get that, did you? Yeah. I, 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 I've come to this conclusion, and this is my attitude today. If God's will and I'm going to tell you something. People say things about God's will, but I just wonder where they got it from. <laughs> if God's will for my city was not to have revival, let me just say that hypothetically, was not to have revival. If all God truly wanted was to raise up one mature, obedient son, a son who would refuse to be offended in this political and spiritual hour we're living in at this moment. Refuse to be offended. Refuse to react. Refuse to harbor unforgiveness. I am determined to be that person who shall bring pleasure to Christ. Amen. Wow. I 
don't go out of here so why he doesn't believe in revival. <laughs> I do. But I don't want it worked up. You can tell when it's worked up, church. Come on. Yeah, Come on. You know how the first time I know it's really worked up? is when the least mature people in the church go head over heels over. Yeah. <laughs> they, back there, they, they're getting it back here, Brother Isaac. I mean, they're them. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you see the least spiritual people in the church falling for a charlatan, it's not real. I'm saying all that to say this. I want genuine move of God. And you can tell when it's genuine. If it ain't genuine, then I'm embarrassed. Oh, no. Some of you are too silent and you're making me nervous. Come on, Sandra. Let, let's go ahead and help them out. <laughs> I realize that we're all on individual journeys and I can't expect everyone to be on the same level that's totally unrealistic but I am a pastor not an evangelist now I have been invited to church and I've, some people in my church came and said Pastor, I thought you were a pastor. Man, you, you spoke like an evangelist. I know how to do what I need to do when I, where I'm invited to go to do something like that. But my true calling is a pastor. And I'm saying this to say this. I'm going to protect my sheep. Right. The devil would like to take out the shepherd so he can scatter the sheep. Yeah, that's right. But he's also going to try to find places in the church where there's vulnerability immaturity and lack of discipleship and then he then he'll use people to pull them out just one or two at a time in the body of Christ today we have to be discipled and God is not God is not interested on how much you're interested in revival God is more interested in you being made into the image of Jesus Christ and his character by his word for the glory of Jesus Christ himself.